All right, I'm here. It's a Friday. Welcome. Twitch.tv slash 110sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live, wherever you might be joining us from. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. We had an NFL game last night. The Chiefs, they're still good. They still got the best quarterback in the sport. Still got a lot of weapons and Iron Man Andy Reid still on the sidelines. Unfortunately, though, we're in a situation where we're not talking about football because on multiple occasions yesterday, NFL players were seen once again as NFL players first rather than people. I suppose I'm not allowed to be surprised. But it still sucks. We'll talk about it in a, just a minute. Uh, the Lakers, they're in control of that series. Uh, it didn't exactly... I mean, you're welcome to be surprised if the Rockets are competitive in, in this series, but it's, yesterday was a must-win in a lot of ways for the Rockets, and James Harden was non-existent. Fewest field goals he's made in the game, tied for the fewest field goals he's made in the game this season. The only reason he had 21 points is because he's a master of manipulation when it comes to getting to the free throw line and was 16 of 20 from the stripe. Took more free throws by himself than the entire Lakers team. Now, we can talk about whether or not what Harden's able to do around the basket uh, is ridiculous or not. But he's good at it, and whatever he's figured out, he does it very consistently. But when James Harden goes 2 of 11 from the field, they're not winning basketball games, and he needed to win that one. And here we are again in another playoffs where James Harden disappears. When you need him to be the you know, all-time great offensive player that he is. But we'll get to that in the next segment. Game 7 of Celtics-Raptors. Uh, it could be the best game of the entire postseason. We'll see, but we'll talk about that as well as we get prepared for that one. Like I said, I want to talk about the NFL here in the first segment, but before we, we get to that, we have to um, take note of today, uh, have a moment of appreciation for the brave men and women who gave their lives in service to this country and were the first responders to the attacks on the Twin Towers uh, 19 years ago today. Never forget those people and those, you know, the thousands of people who lost their lives that day, the thousands of people who, who stepped up without a second thought on that day. And, and, and try not to forget the, the unity with which the country came together on that day. It's hard to imagine nowadays. The country is so divided on so many things. And there's such an inability to have real conversations about those things. But also remember that part of this. And, you know, a, a day that was supposed to strike at the core of the country... Uh, really made it stronger in a lot of ways and brought it together, you know, the country together in a time a, on a very, very tragic day. So don't let the fact that we're in the middle of a COVID, of a global pandemic, that uh, there are a lot of things going on. It's an election year. There's, there's so many other things to be talking about today. There was football yesterday. There's football this weekend. Um, just take a moment, however that might be, um, to to appreciate uh, the men and women who lost their lives on that day because that is that is what this day is about. It's while it's a day that is very tragic and and um, unbelievably uh, sad, it's also one that we should continue to set aside. To could, we should continue to set aside to to honor those people. Uh, who were of, who were 
serving this country on that on that particular day. So uh, please never forget. However you do that, you know, read some articles. Um, you know, find a story. You know, so I, I find that some of the more impactful stories about 9/11 are the ones that center around a specific person. Um, find somebody's story. Excuse me. Find somebody's story uh, and just. Make sure that we, do, that regardless of what, where we are in this country, regardless of what's going on, that we take take this day to to not let that fall into uh, fall into the background and and have that be uh, forgotten in any way. But yes, Zach, if you're still in here, the NFL athletes were failed yesterday in multiple ways. We'll start with Skip Bayless, Dak Prescott, put himself in an incredibly scary and vulnerable position to speak out about his mental health and the things that he over the last few months has been going through and he talked about you know feeling emotions that he had never felt before and essentially skip bayless went on undisputed on fox sports yesterday and basically said that dak prescott was weak because he was having those feelings What? How is this still a reaction to this? This is, there are few things that are more important than normalizing this. Than normalizing the ability to, because they're people, Zach. And you're the problem. You're the problem. Because they're people first and not athletes. That's like you coming home and being upset about something in your personal life and your your mom telling you to just shut up and go to work and make money. How is that fair to you? Is it just fair because they play sports and you feel entitled to their entertainment? Not a chance. It wasn't even on the football field. And we can get to the Chiefs here in a minute. We can get to the Chiefs here in a minute, whose fans booed at a sign of unity. It had nothing to do with the flag, nothing to do with anything. Dak Prescott wasn't even on the football field. So it's not even about the sport. It's not like right before the game he stopped and said, you know what, I'm really struggling with my mental health right now. If he had said that, it would have been fine. It would have been received even more poorly than it usually is. But that would have been just as legitimate. And because this... This has way more to do with what Dak Prescott's voice, how far it carries, than with Dak Prescott himself, if that makes sense. So, let me explain. There are a lot of people that look up to Dak Prescott, and there are a lot of people that turn their heads and look when Dak Prescott says something. Dak Prescott has a voice, and it's invaluable. The impact that Dak Prescott coming out and being a very a being vulnerable, it's invaluable what that could mean for somebody who looks up to him. And the fact that he's a young, successful man in this country, and 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 we seem in this country, and a lot of times in this country, and I think this is part of it, is that that we feel like athletes aren't allowed to have issues because of how wealthy they are. Now, is 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 money one thing that athletes have to worry about? No. And is the stress that comes with trying to pay bills and make ends meet oftentimes a, you know adding fuel to the fire of other things yes but that certainly doesn't mean that if that, that doesn't alleviate making money doesn't solve all problems and i think that i think that gets lost sometimes i think that's part of why this is so this continues to be a problem because i think there's a there's a feeling of you know anytime somebody gets hurt the first thing you see on twitter is somebody saying well at least he's well compensated for his pain like what
it's much more this is so much more about Dak Prescott the person than Dak Prescott the football player right because him being a quarterback is his job and is important to the Dallas Cowboys and their future and their success but Dak Prescott's mental state is so much more important and Dak Prescott speaking out about his mental state and being vulnerable like that makes it much it is is a positive force and maybe somebody else speaking out and, and trying to get help and speaking about it because because Dak did because that quarterback that they look up to was willing to talk about it because that's that that's the that's the ultimate point here the ultimate point here is we have to normalize and talking about mental health normalize not being okay because mental health does not discriminate and Dak Prescott's a perfect example of that from the outside looking in it looks like there are very few reasons for Dak Prescott to be depressed or sad or have the emotions that he talked about never having before but we don't know and we know even less about people who aren't in the public in the public light and if we break that stigma and if we normalize it the more people feel comfortable talking about it the more people are going to be saved from it instead of losing the battle with their mind because they feel like they can't get it out and they feel like they can't talk about it that's why this is important that's why what skip bayless said is so wrong and the fact that you know he's such a popular sports voice talking head that that doesn't help break that stigma that helps reinforce it and we have to get to a point where and, and then there's this other underlying where we feel entitled and i think this is more chiefs text and, and like they were standing for unity yes they chose to to not be there for the national anthem But this stand of unity had nothing to do with with anything other than the Chiefs and Texans players saying we might be opponents on the field, but we stand in unity right now. Before we play this game, we stand in unity. Honestly, I don't see how that's political, and I would love to talk to a Chiefs fan or, or anybody in the stadium who booed, whether it's a Chiefs fan or a Texans fan. I don't know. I don't care who who booed and really asked them to explain why they felt like they needed to boo why they wanted to boo because i still think that because the, you know from from Colin Kaepernick this has not been about the flag but it's the time in which it gets the most conversation started The point of standing for unity or kneeling for the national anthem has nothing to do with the flag and nothing to do with disrespecting it. It has everything to do with equality and unity and feeling safe and not and, and showing in some sort of peaceful protest things that need to be fixed. What, what happened yesterday, and, and this is the biggest... This is the biggest point, uh, and this is this is sort of where where I want to to wrap it all up. Yesterday was a pretty crystal clear reminder that a lot of people still think of athletes as athletes only, and that there's just a an an inability a lot of times to forget that these athletes are people too, and more importantly, people first. But it gets people's attention. 
clearly nothing else gets people's attention. Because what what people equate that to is people equate it to not supporting the people who protect the country, not supporting, you know, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to say, what they're still, what they're protesting has nothing to do with the flag pro they, they are protesting police brutality, social inequality, whatever phrase you want to use. But that's when there are the most eyes. And that's the point to peaceful protest when there are the most eyes and get conversation going because doing it, Elsewhere has no impact, and they're they're not disrespecting the flag. That's what that's the point you're missing. They're not disrespecting the flag. They're making a stand against social inequality, and on the biggest stage in sports, that's the place that gets the most attention. There's no disrespect for like I. You could ask anybody who's ever kneeled for the for the anthem. That, that it is not about the flag. And what happened yesterday had nothing to do with the flag. We can talk about, we can talk around, we can talk circles and circles and circles about the flag. But what happened yesterday had nothing to do with the flag. There was nothing political about that. They didn't have signs. They didn't say anything. They were just standing in unity. Just like the way that the NBA players were standing in unity in the bubble. And that's, and that's the other part of this. That, that part of this is the NFL's fault because they, they're so busy trying to fight what their players are fighting for. Or fight the, the player. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? It's fight what the players are fighting for. Rather than the NBA who empowers their players to fight what they're fighting. To, to, who empowers their players to fight about for for the fight of things that go on outside of the sport because the nfl has created this this space that that it's it's met negatively always does that make sense and and, and i think the fact that the nba i mean the nba stands in unity they have their their social messaging on their jerseys on the court And then it's about basketball after that, which is which is not you know the point is for it to not all be about basketball, and that's clearly the point that they're making prior to the game. But because the the NBA has empowered their players, the NBA has created an atmosphere and a space for their players to talk about and be about what they care about outside of the sport. And the NFL hasn't done that, which is which is why this is met with so much more hostility. And, and you, you saw, you, you saw, um, help. I'm drawing a blank. Roger Goodell. Sorry. You, you saw him go and recently he talked about, you know, wishing that they had react, that, that they had met Colin Kaepernick differently and that, that, that they, they, they messed up. But it, but it's left such a, such a ingrained at this point response to this sort of thing. Which is unfortunate because I mean, they, the, what the Chiefs and Texans did last night was not me was meant to show unity and nothing else. And it was met with boos, and it's just in and that along with the fact that Dak Prescott came out and said, "Listen, I'm I'm struggling with health, my mental health," and he got met with being told he was weak. When in a lot of ways, that just means he's strong and vulnerable and willing to be a leader. Quite frankly, I'd love for my quarterback to be able to be vulnerable like that. Because in my opinion, that shows leadership. Which is what we want from a quarterback anyways. We need leadership. And certainly not a... a, a it's certainly not a notch in the reasons he's not a leader column. Or a reasons he's weak column. NFL athletes are people. And it, we forgot that yesterday, but this is, you know, it's a chance to, to get better now. Coming up next, we'll talk about the, you know, the, the Lakers there in the driver's seat now, and it's looking like we actually are going to get that Lakers 
uh, Clippers Western Conference Finals. We've got Game 7 of the Celtics Raptors coming up tonight. I'm super pumped about that one. We'll talk about uh, the Lakers beating the Rockets last night a little bit more and, and that Game 7. We'll do that next on the Jimmel Show on 110sportsmedia.com. Welcome back to the Jamal Show on a Friday. Twitch.tv slash 110sports. 110sportsmedia.com slash slide. Thanks so much for joining us wherever might you might be doing that from. It's a nice day outside. Listen, we've got NBA playoffs. We've got opening weekend uh, of the NFL season. It's going to be a good weekend. It's going to be a really good weekend, and and we've got this great concoction of sports, you know what I mean? Like, like we're, st- we're like, next week, we're talking about the U.S. Open. We've never talked about the U.S. Open and a major at the same time. I mean, excuse me, a major and football at the same time. That's awesome. And, and you've got some, uh, you got some real football team. I mean, no disrespect to the teams who played last week, but you got some real football teams playing on the college side of things this week now. They're, they won't be competitive, but you've got some top 25 teams playing. Um, we'll pull that up real quick here. But you've got some actual football teams. So I'm like, oh, they're playing this week. Cool. I mean, Syracuse, North Carolina, that's uh, North Carolina breaking to 18th. Uh, Notre Dame playing Duke. Oklahoma uh, plays tomorrow night. They play Missouri State, but I'm really excited about uh, seeing Spencer Rattler play he was named uh the starting quarterback for oklahoma this season just a couple days ago Uh, it's probably been a week or so now but excited about that one uh clemson playing wake forest texas utep ucf playing florida international you got some you got some real football teams playing 
and I'm excited. The U.S. Open. The U.S. Open. Uh, golf's uh, second major of the year, I guess. Uh, and then you got the Masters in November. You got football and the Masters. That doesn't usually happen. That's a that's quite a, a, a dream weekend. You've never heard of the U.S. Open. Okay. Um, okay. Thank goodness. He's he's kidding. Don't worry. Uh, but right now, let's talk about the NBA. Listen, the Lakers are a better basketball team than the Rockets. I don't know if you knew this. And, and I talked about this uh, a couple of you know, before this series started. That I, I thought that this series had a chance to be more interesting than the series that the Thunder could give to the Lakers. Because they can shoot the lights out. But they're also led by James Harden and Russell Westbrook. Who aren't exactly at the top of my list when it comes to guys I'd like to have in the playoffs leading my team. James Harden. 2 of 11 from the field. And we talked about this right at the top of the show. But he was he had 21 points, but he, he took 20 free throws. They were 30 of 39 from the line. They took 39 free throws, outscored the Lakers by 15 at the line. Took more, you know James Harden took more by himself than the Lakers did in the entire game. They still lost by 10. Usually that's a place that you look at, and if you're do- if you're winning the free throw line by that many, you're gonna have a good chance to win, especially when you're 14 of 33 from the th- three point line to the Lakers nine of 30. But the Lakers out rebounded them by twenty six. That's pretty pretty preposterous, to be honest with you. That's a lot. Uh, they're just getting absolutely dominated on the boards. Eric Gordon, Russell Westbrook. I mean, Eric, Russell Westbrook has been pretty good in this series, but he was you know eight of 16, 25 points. Had a pretty good game, but Eric Gordon six of fourteen from the field. And when James Harden's going to go two of eleven and just sort of disappear like that, like. I, I refuse to give him credit for getting to the line 20 times any more than he's a master of manipulation and, and we knew that and he's great at drawing contact and getting to the line. But like 16 of 20, you should be walking to 40 points if you're James Harden, if you've taken, if you've taken 20 free throws. If you're taking 20 free throws and you're as offensively gifted as James Harden, you should be walking to 40 points, not walking to 21. 16 of his 21 points came from the free throw line. You know, LeBron didn't have a great game. Anthony Davis, 10 of 18 from the floor. Honestly, and we talked about this on on this podcast right here, the Jays for Days podcast, but, you know, Sometimes I wish Anthony Davis would take more shots. He only took 14 in the last game. He ended up with like 28 points. Um, you know, he gets to the free throw line so many times that it's it's a little different. He went to the free throw line nine times in this one. But sometimes I wish he'd, he'd, he'd take a few more shots. Uh, LeBron, 7 of 17 from the floor. Uh, 0 of 5 from the three-point line. But he had 16, 15, and 9. Uh, and a plus, of minus, plus minus of 15, which is the, the best on the Lakers in this game. So... LeBron's one of the better players ever in impacting when it comes to impacting a game when he's not scoring it well. Um, but if you look at these numbers, I mean, you got 29 from AD. You got you didn't get any more than 16 from anybody else. Rondo, another 11, 10, and 8. Playoff Rondo is an asset. Thank you very much. Uh, Caruso, one of the biggest cult followings in the NBA. He had 16 on 5 of 9 shooting. He was really great down the stretch. And... Uh, I never thought that we'd get to a point where Alex Caruso is not only a part of a, a major part of what the Lakers do in a playoff series, but is actually like you don't feel bad about it. And that's the thing that throws me off more than anything is like he used to just be that guy who had a cult following from Lakers fans because honestly, he doesn't look like he should be an NBA player, but he is and he's a pretty good one. Played really well in this one. 16 points, three three rebounds, two assists. The Lakers got that bench production. They got 27 from those two guys. You got nine more from Kuzma and Taylor Horton Tucker. You'd like Kuzma to little be a little bit more consistent. He's either getting you four or getting you 14. If he can live between nine and 14, I think that even is that's even more helpful. 
Only played 22 minutes in this one, and but he did take sh six shots, and you like to see a little bit more from Kuzma off the bench. But they they got some production across the board in this one, which was able to cancel out the fact that LeBron only had 16 points. And what I mean by that, if we look at game if we look at game four, game three, excuse me, in that game you had AD had 26, LeBron had 36. And he got 21 from Rondo, but only other, one other guy was in double figures, and he got 0, 2, and 6 from the other three starters uh, for the Lakers. They also they also switched up the starting lineup a little bit, I believe, unless I missed something there, but I believe there was no... Yep, yeah, so, so Marcus Morris in the starting lineup. J, uh, McGee didn't actually play in this game after starting in Game 3. Uh, went a little bit smaller. Lakers Heat, Heat Finals, I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all. Um, and I also don't hate the idea of them being able to win that series if we actually get to a Lakers Heat Finals. You know, the Heat are playing incredibly well. And, you know, it's kind of been a foregone conclusion that the Lakers, that whoever gets out of the West is going to win the Finals. I don't think that's quite a foregone conclusion because... I mean, the Heat had to beat the Bucks. They're going to have to beat either Toronto or Boston, who are both very good. In a lot of ways, the Eastern Conference team is going to have to be playing better than the Western Conference team. I mean, the Clippers got the Mavericks that were hurt and not anywhere near their full, their full, uh, not anywhere near full health. The Lakers got the Trailblazers, who were also at by the end of that series not anywhere near full health. The Clippers get the Nuggets in this round, and the Lakers get the Rockets. I mean, both, they, they don't have to be playing particularly well to win this series. The Clippers just sort of mess around for a lot of most games. And still, I mean, they won their last game by 11 and only scored 96 points. If Miami wins, they've beat the Bucks, and then they've beat Boston slash Boston slash Toronto, and if if the Celtics win, they swept Philly. I mean, who was a train wreck by the end of that series, but still a Joel Embiid Sixers team, the Raptors, the defending champs, and the Heat team that just beat the number one overall seed. That's pretty impressive. Like they're like you'd be hard pressed to find a more spectacular like group of teams that they beat to get to the finals the point being is that whoever that eastern conference team is is going to be playing really well and there are holes for both la teams the clippers need their bench to be better much better the lakers you know they look much better but if and in this one in particular we talked about it they got 10 from from danny green and 10 from kcp which cancels out the fact that LeBron didn't get 36. In fact, if you look at you, know, if we do simple math, he got 36 in that one. In, in Game Three, he got 16 in this one, but you got 20 points from Danny Green and KCP that you didn't get in the other one. Make up for it. Rondo had 11, Alex Crusoe 16, and you, you put the pieces together like that. But that's they they haven't been that consistent. LeBron and AD have just been that good, at least in this series. So there are certainly questions there for both teams. And like there are questions for the, the Eastern Conference side of things as well, but those Eastern Conference teams are good, man. Those top three teams are better than the top three teams in the West because we're talking about Denver being the third best team, by definition at least. The Celtics are the third best team by definition in the Eastern Conference, and that's pretty terrifying and we're talking about a heat team who was the five seed technically i mean they were the five seed the lakers are i mean now they're in control both both la teams are up 3-1 this though both of those series are over those the, the rockets and nuggets aren't winning three straight games it's just not going to happen it's just sort of a matter of time until we see when those series end you know, originally it looked like the Laker, the Eastern Conference Finals were going to start way earlier than the Western Conference Finals. At this point, it doesn't quite look like that. I mean, you're you're probably going to get, you know, in a perfect world, the the 
Clippers series ends tonight. Uh, of course, the the Eastern Conference Finals will be set after tonight. So you get Game 1 of the Eastern Conference Finals either on Sunday or Monday. And then you get Game 1 of the West, If assuming that the, the Western Conference Finals are solidified after Saturday uh, when the, the Rockets lose Game 5. Then you got them you know, Monday, Tuesday, right there. And you're right on schedule, so it'll be uh, a much more closer. And, and I, neither team, I think both of those series will go... Uh, deep, so you're getting two really good series and, and, and one team not sitting around waiting for the other team to to make it to the NBA Finals. With that being said, Raptors-Celtics, we got them. Game 7, and, and I, this isn't exactly how I thought we'd get there. I mean, you had, the, at the beginning of this series, the Celtics were .5 seconds away from going up, two, going up 3-0 and the series being effectively over. They're up 3-2. You felt like at times they were the better team, and then in Game Six, and you thought they might be able to close it out. Norman Powell happens; he has 15 points in the two overtimes, while Pascal Siakam is continues to be completely irrelevant. Five of 19 and 54 minutes for 12 points. Kyle Lowry was great, solidified the game there, but he he and Van Vliet were not great in the in overtime either. They just got. You know, Lowry made the the shot that sort of sealed it, but Fred Van Vliet can't seem to stop taking 30-foot jump shots like he's Steph Curry. There's only three people in the NBA allowed to take 30-foot jumpers whenever they want to, and Fred Van Vliet's, Van Vliet's not one of them. None of them were particularly close either, so points to what I just said. Really, this was... Here's why I think the Celtics are going to win tonight. I have zero faith in Pascal Siakam to be anything more than 12 points on 16 shots. Maybe 15 points on 17 shots, but he had, he had 23 in game in game 5, and the only reason he had 23 is because he played a lot of minutes and took 23 shots. And he got to the free throw line a few times. So he was 10 of 23. That was his best game in the series. 33 points from Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet getting 21. That's 54 combined. I think that's roughly where we're going to be. But you're not going to get 23 from Norman Powell. And you, I find it really hard to believe that Kemba Walker goes 2 of 11 from the field for 5 points in 52 minutes again. Just find it really hard to believe. Tatum, 29. Jalen Brown, 31. He really was on fire to start that game. Cooled off a little bit. Took 30 shots in this one, which is a ton. Ended up 31 and 16, but took too many shots. Um the Raptors needed two overtimes in which they got 23 from Norman Powell. That's not going to happen again. You're going to get at least 15 from Kemba. I think, you know, we we've seen him in, you know, he's been a big a big game player since he was at Connecticut. I mean, UConn won that tournament on his back. And they won the Big East tournament on his back. He shows up in big games. I expect him to show up tonight. I don't have the same feelings about Norman Powell, who was 6 of 11 from the field, and inexplicably they let Norman Powell, whose main job is to knock down shots, let him get to the free throw line nine times. So he was all over the place in this one, and, and, and props to him. You know, He showed up and they were able to get the job done, but I, I, I find it hard to believe he's going to back up that performance with anything similar because, listen, I mean, if we look at his game log, he had 23. He's at 23 and 16 in the last two. But prior to that, in the first four games of the series, it was 5, 8, 4, and 10. On 1 of 6, 3 of 4, 1 of 5, 4 of 12 shooting. And he hadn't played more than 27 minutes, and he's played 31 and 38 in the last two. Maybe he, he, he will probably get 35 minutes or so again. Because clearly that there, there's something there. But he was only 6 of 15 on Monday, so he's 6 of 15 for 16 points. Took 11 three-pointers. That's ultimately not... That's not a net positive, in my opinion. I mean, and Boston also won 111-89, to 89, so that game wasn't particularly close. But what I do know is that it's going to be close. I find it really hard to believe that, the, that either of these teams is going to let it be a blowout. You got two incredibly good coaches on both, uh, on both sides, and Brad Stevens and Nick Nurse. 
you got Kyle. I, I think Kyle Lowry. I, I have faith in Kyle Lowry to step to show up in a big game. Pascal Siakam, not so much. But clearly, this is a close series, even without Siakam performing well. I, I find it hard to believe, you know, you thought at some point he'd go off for 30 in a game. I find it really hard to believe it's going to be this one after what we've seen in the first six games. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, of course I'll be wrong. He'll go off for 30 on 14 shots in this one, and the Raptors will walk to a win. I'm, you know, that that's how it goes, right? But I think it would be silly to predict that to happen. I still think the Celtics, you know, since game one in this series, you know, I, w- I, I was leaning Raptors in seven a couple weeks ago after game one. I was leaning Celtics in seven. I'm going to stick with that that secondary lean and go with Celtics in seven. Uh, but I'm happy that this is provided, you know, this is provided the series that we thought it would. We thought it would come down to a game seven. At least I did. And that's exactly what's happened, which is which is great considering after game two we thought that this series might be over and with 0.5 seconds left in game three we thought the series was definitely over because it didn't look like the raptors were going to win that one they get a shot from og and anobi and and here we are uh and the result is a highly competitive series but more than anything i'm rooting for a competitive one one that makes you watch until the very end uh i think we're going to get that and, and there's an intensity in this series that proves that you can get some intensity in a playoff series, uh, even without fans. These teams don't like each other. They're tired of each other. And uh, things, you know, have gotten chippy, have gotten physical. And that's going to provide a very intense, very uh, exciting and very fun to watch game seven. And the winner gets the heat. The winner gets the heat. And, and that's a scary basketball team as well, uh, of course, after we... Uh, determine who the second half of the Eastern Conference Finals participants are. We'll talk about that on Monday. But game seven tonight. I mean, there is a Clippers Nuggets game tonight. Uh, I expect the Clippers to finish the series out. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, they're just the better basketball team. They should just finish it up um, and move on to to the Lakers and we'll hopefully be able to talk about that series about to get underway when we get to Monday as well coming up next we'll do the podium uh some FYI and uh we'll get out of here on a Friday you're watching the Jamal show thank you so much for joining us on 110 sportsmedia.com
Yeah, so I just realized uh, I had the show starting soon graphic rather than the we'll be right back graphic, but you get the point. We're back. Uh, it's twitch.tv slash 110sports, 110sportsmedia.com slash live, wherever you're joining us on a Friday. Hope you're having a great Friday and uh, working closer and closer to the weekend. Got football this weekend. Got playoff basketball this weekend. Got a lot of things uh, to watch in the sports world. Over the next few days, I want to get to the podium in honor of the first week of the NFL season. My podium this week is the three games that I'm most excited for in order of least excited to to most excited, but my top three, bronze, silver, and gold. Listen, there there's some good games this weekend. Some good games this weekend. There are two in particular that uh, I think sort of stand above the rest, and I don't think I'm I'm sort of I, I don't think I'm uh, unique for thinking that. But let's start with the bronze medal. You know, I'm really intrigued by the way Joe Burrow looks. Bengals Chargers. Three o five kickoff on Sunday. You know, it's either I'm looking either for great matchups or highly anticipated rookies just to see what they look like out of the gates. And we got two games that are highly anticipated matchups. The rest are some are interesting, but for the most part, one team. You know, you got Colts Jaguars. The Jaguars are going to be a train wreck. Seahawks Falcons. The Seahawks uh, I think are one of the teams that will compete. Uh, they'll certainly be one of the teams competing for uh, that AFC West, excuse me, NFC West title. The Falcons, not nearly as likely, in, in my opinion, to be to be all that great, especially with the Saints and Buccaneers being in that in that division. Jets Bills, the Jets are going to be a train wreck. Shouts to the Bills, Bears Lions. I mean, it's Mitchell Trubisky. Like it can only be so interesting Dolphins Patriots the Patriots you know that one's interesting because of Cam Newton but it, to see what that looks like in in this first week but other than that not a whole lot of not a whole lot of draw I'm curious to see what Joe Burrow looks like and, and to see what that Bengals team looks like I mean just they were so bad last year very very intrigued by that one the the Chargers are minus three on the money line so Chargers expected to win that one, but uh, I'm very intrigued by Joe Burrow uh, and certainly one I'll be trying to keep an eye on, if nothing else. But there are two games here that are much better than, than all of the other ones, in my opinion. Monday Night Football is the, the Steelers and the Giants, which is, you know, eh, Steelers are going to be good this year. But And then you got Titans, Broncos, which doesn't do a whole lot for me either. But my silver medal. So bronze was was the Bengals because I'm interested in Joe Burrow. Silver medal, Packers, Vikings. Those are the two teams that are going to be fighting for that uh, that division. They don't like each other. Uh, there, there's not a whole lot of uh, amicable relationships there. The Vikings solidified their pass rush even more. Kirk Cousins is a good quarterback. There are there are questions about what he can do in the playoffs, of course, but he's a good quarterback. He had a good year last year, and that's a very. There's a lot of reasons to be really excited. You know, they got Justin Jefferson in the draft from LSU, and you know, even though they got rid of a you know a unhappy Stephon Diggs, that you know, there's. There's certainly an argument, you know, Justin Jefferson was very, very good at LSU and certainly a chance that he's very good in the NFL. And if nothing else, you got an unhappy guy off of your team, which I still, which I think that for the most part is a, is a good thing, regardless of how good he is. And while Stevon Diggs is very good, it's, you know, he's not an all time great, uh, wide receiver. So then you've got the Packers, who you know, thirteen and three last year. Matt Lafleur, Lafleur uh, back again, of course. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, still you know proving that he's relevant. I wish they would have gotten him a little bit more help, but they didn't. Uh, but either way, those are the two best teams in that division, and seeing them right out of the gates is going to be going to be awesome. Minnesota favored uh, minus two and a half because it's it's in Minnesota. And then first, far and away, you got the new look. Buccaneers, Rob Gronkowski, uh, Tom Brady, 
Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Nadama Sue. Like you got every, you, you got Tom Brady with weapons and a pretty good defense on the other side of things versus the Saints who still might win that division. Now, in our 110 Sports predictions uh, for the NFL divisions, that is on 110sportsmedia.com if you would like to check that one out. Listen, the last time Tom Brady had weapons like that was... In 2007, Randy Moss was a Patriot. In 2007, the Patriots went 17-0. and 16-0, and excuse me. My bad. Uh, 16-0 and in the regular season, losing in the Super Bowl to uh, Eli Manning and the New York Giants. But listen... Wasn't they, I mean, they were far and away the best team in the NFL, far and away, eighteen and one. Tom Brady's got a lot of weapons, man, and took a Patriots team deep last year that didn't have a lot of weapons there either. I think Tom Brady is is wants to prove that it's not Bill Belichick that makes Tom Brady, that Tom Brady makes Tom Brady, and he's just as good without him. He's got a lot of pieces there with him. Like, there's... I'm not going to bet against Tom Brady. I'm not going to do it. The Bucks were one of the most prolific offenses as, offenses in the NFL last season from a yards from a total yards perspective and you've got Jameis Winston who who finished the season averaging the most yards through the air per game. Now you're going to put Tom Brady in that situation and and Tom Brady's not going to go throw go and throw 30 picks like Jameis did. That's really scary to me and and Alvin Kamara, Drew Brees, Michael Thomas like there's a lot of weapons over there too. And continuity is certainly a, a thing. But man, that's going to be exciting. And that's why it's far and away my gold uh, my gold medal for the podium today. Bucks, Saints, right out there. We're hitting you right in the face, right out of the bat with this with this football game. And I'm incredibly excited about it and, and, and excited for football. It's not the same... Uh, this year in terms of getting excited for it just because it's kind of snuck up on me but uh, I, I am looking forward to it and uh, I hope that things go as well as they possibly can and that we continue to keep everybody as safe as we can as possible in a world in which we've decided to, to play football FYI for your information ladies and gentlemen There's not a whole lot of FYI here. We touched on a lot of it. Yeah? We touched on a lot of it. Like I said, Game 7, Celtics, Raptors. Uh, that's coming up tonight. Really, really excited for that one. Chiefs got a little bit thinner at cor cornerback yesterday. Um, had an injury in their secondary. Uh, Char Charvarius Ward. Fractured his hand during the, the season opening win against the Texans. Their other starter, Bashad Breland, is serving a four game NFL suspension for the substance abuse policy. They're 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 pretty thin in, in the secondary now, the Chiefs are, but you know, the, it's Patrick Mahomes and, and I still have a lot of faith in that team. You've also got Sixers, excuse me, not Sixers, Nuggets. Clippers uh, coming up tonight as well, and we're getting very, very close to, to Eastern Conference and Western Conference finals. But watch some football this weekend. Stay safe, please. Uh, I'll be back on Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, we'll talk hope, We'll talk some football for sure. Hopefully we'll talk about the Eastern Conference and Western Conference finals that are about to begin, and uh, and we'll go from there. Uh Touchline Talk with Josh Doring, Around the Bases with Chris Brown, 11 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so be on the lookout for those. Uh, we're going to record a bonfire today uh, talking about the NFL, for, so be on the lookout for that in the next day or so as well. But I'll be back on Monday, same time, same place, 11 a.m. Eastern. Stay safe, and I'll see you on Monday.